So statistically, for those of you who made New Year's resolutions, which is actually a small percentage of the population that actually officially makes New Year's resolutions, approximately a third of you have already broken them. And if you give to the middle of this week, I think January 12th is kind of the, the, the break point, approximately a half of those who make resolutions will fall off by January 12th. So that's just your word of optimism for the day. But we're at that time, we're at that season where people are thinking, what, what do I need to do differently? What do I need to change? What needs to happen in my life that I'm going to do better this year? That I'm, that I'm going to accomplish this year? What, what's that project or that goal, that thing in my life that I'm going to work on for this coming year, for 2019? And so many of these boil down to patterns and routines. Whether it's waking up early to go to the gym or have a longer time reading your Bible or, or whether it's that pattern of eating more healthily, healthily, eating more healthy foods. It's, it comes down to patterns and routines. It comes down to how you regulate your life in order to accomplish these goals. Many of these patterns matter. They matter for our physical health. They matter for what forward progress we want to see in our lives. But I want to exhort to you a new pattern. Perhaps an updated pattern. Perhaps a more emphasized pattern. I want to exhort you today toward gospel rhythms. Gospel rhythms. I want you to embrace the rhythms of the gospel in your life. The book of Acts in the Bible, it's in the New Testament, it's the history book of the New Testament. It was written to record the, the history of the early church and the initial spread of the gospel throughout much of the Roman Empire. Acts was written by the gospel writer Luke. So if you take them together, you have Jesus, his words and work in the gospel of Luke, and then you have what happened next. In the book of Acts. It's literally the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus came. He did this. He accomplished this. Died on the cross. Ascended into heaven. And the book of Acts opens with Jesus standing on top of the mountain saying, You are my witnesses. Take this into all the world. And then he ascends out of their sight. And the Apostles are looking at each other saying, uh, What do we do next? It didn't really sink in that he had told them to go. Be his witnesses, but that sunk in about 10 days later when they came out of a long prayer meeting. The power of the Holy Spirit came upon them and they started preaching in the streets of Jerusalem openly about Jesus and the resurrection. We see the story continue in the book of Acts as the church starts in Jerusalem and grows massively. In the first couple weeks that they're there, they grow to 3,000, 5,000, 7,000 people that are part of this new early church. They're trying to figure things out. But very shortly thereafter, persecution strikes. Persecution strikes as we see the gospel spreading both to Samaria and to even to the Gentiles. Persecution strikes and one of the prominent leaders of the early church, a man by the name of Stephen, a servant of the church, is publicly stoned to death there in Jerusalem. And this causes a massive spreading of the gospel. No longer are these several thousand people united in one place, gathering to worship, but then they are dispersed. Persecution strikes and people are literally taking what they can carry in their arms as refugees and fleeing the city. And they go to the surrounding regions and cities and towns. And what we see is that everywhere they go, the gospel spreads. The Apostle Paul's story is recorded in the book of Acts. It starts with a focus mainly on the Apostle Peter, and then it moves to the story of the Apostle Paul, Peter the Apostle to, to the Jews, initially taking it to the Gentiles with a man named Cornelius. And then the Apostle Paul's story picks up as he is sent out by one of these little church stars, the church of Antioch, as an apostle to the Gentiles. And the rest of the book works itself out following the voyages and the, and the journeys of the Apostle Paul. By the time we reach Acts 17, Paul is in the middle of his second major missionary journey. And we see he's got some patterns in place. 
in his life. What struck me as, we were, as I was preparing for this message was just a small phrase here found in Acts 17, verses 1 through 3. If you have a copy of the Word, I encourage you to open it up and turn it on. Not the words will be here next to me on the screen. The book of Acts in the New Testament, chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Hear the Word of the Lord. Now when they, that's the Apostle Paul and his fellow travelers, had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. The main point that I want you to see this morning, that I want you to, to embrace this morning, is that we need to live with a strategic, intentional gospel rhythm. We need to live with a strategic, intentional gospel rhythm. First thing I want you to see is that sharing the gospel is a pattern of life. Sharing the gospel is a pattern of life. The book of Acts, as we've briefly recounted, records that persecution arose early in the life of the church. Less than one generation, you could calculate it to probably less than a year since the starting of the church, persecution arose heavily in the city of Jerusalem. You have this large group of people, several thousand, gathering together, and it started to irritate the religious leaders of the day. And you find Stephen, an early servant of the church, who is drug out before the people and publicly stoned to death after defending and proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And at that stoning of Stephen, we see this dispersion happening in Acts chapter 8 verse 1. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The apostles stayed put. And then in Acts chapter 11, we get another little snippet into this story. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 21. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, that's the Greeks, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. What we see here is that the first century church, the Christians there in Jerusalem were forced to flee for their belief in the resurrection of Jesus. But what do we see happen when they flee? They flee to all these small towns and all these little cities. And as they're fleeing, because of the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're still talking about it. You know, if someone tried to hurt you over here for saying something, and you go over to this place and say the same thing, there's something going on with that message. You see, they were fleeing for their lives as refugees to these different cities, literally uprooting their lives from Jerusalem and running to other places, still carrying the message of the gospel. And after this, we see churches popping up in all of these small towns and cities to which the Christians had fled. Because sharing the gospel was not a scheduled event. Going to church was not a scheduled event in their life. It was the pattern of their life. One of these churches was the church in Antioch, who we saw here in Acts chapter 11. This church was the church that sent out the Apostle Paul as a missionary. This was a church that gathered together. And if you were to look at it, this was one of the most diverse churches recorded in the book of Acts as far as gathering people from different regions and different backgrounds all together in the same place. And it's from there that the Apostle Paul was sent as a missionary to the Gentiles. He was sent to those regions that had not yet heard with the purpose and intention of carrying the gospel. Look with me back at Acts 17, verse 2. This is deep into Paul's ministry. And Paul went in 
as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days, reasoned with them from the Scriptures. By this time in Paul's ministry, there was a pattern. There was an expectation. Those traveling with Paul knew where Paul was going to go first. They knew what his custom was. They knew what his pattern, what his rhythm was as he traveled. And we see this set out as we trace through the, the previous chapters. Acts chapter 13, verse 5. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. In 13 verse 14. But when they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia, on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. Verse four, chapter 14 verse 1. Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Chapter 16 verse 3. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. I'm sorry, verse 13. Chapter 16, verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where there was supposed to be a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. The scenario there was that there was no synagogue. But yet the pattern in the culture of that day was that those who were of Jewish background would gather at a place of water, a riverside. And that is where they would worship and pray. So Paul had this pattern set up. This was an established pattern. It was his custom, the text says, to go and proclaim first to the Jews in every city. It was his custom that that's where he would put himself. He would so organize and, and structure his life that he would put himself in front of people and in places where there was an opportunity to proclaim the truth of Jesus. Started with the Sabbath day. But if we were to take the time and read through more closely in these chapters, we would see that after two to three, maybe four weeks in the synagogue, he would then find himself in the middle of the marketplace, or in the town square, or in a local theater, or out in public proclaiming the good news of the gospel. Paul was not haphazard in his approach. He wasn't just flying by the seat of his pants as he went about his life. He was strategic and intentional about where and when he went to different places so that he could engage people with the gospel. Now, if we were to look at the recent history of the Bible-believing church in America, we would find an interesting reality. In the last 50 to 70 years, what can be largely observed by Bible -believing, in Bible-believing churches across America is a tendency to circle the wagons. You know that image, right? In the Old West, when they would travel out west, and these long wagon trains traveling across the plains, going, going west, whether it was for the, the gold rush of 49, or whether it was to try to establish new lands, what they would do is when they would camp out, they would circle the wagons as defense from possible attacks. The last 50 to 70 years has demonstrated a, a pattern and a culture of circling the wagons within the church here in America. As our culture at large has moved rapidly from a biblical morality as being the norm throughout society to now it being a source of mockery, the church's response has often been one of defensive isolation. The monastic temptation. Think monasteries and nunneries is a huge temptation for many Christians, even in our day today. We want to run away and cut ourselves off, wall ourselves off from the, the evil world that surrounds us. We want to grab onto the popular Christian phrase, we want to be in the world but not of the world and run and hide. But there's a problem here because that phrase often connotes the idea of, well, because I'm stuck in this old, dirty world, I'm going to do everything I can not to be part of this world. And there's a defensive mentality. We want to run and hide. We want to wall ourselves off. One of the challenges and blessings in the Christian life and faith is that everything's intertwined. What we believe about a certain thing comes out in how we live in regards to it. 
That happens. You pull on one th string of theology and four or five others are going to come loose. You, you, you change what you think and believe about who God is or about what the church is. And then all of a sudden, how you live and how you think starts coming apart from its biblical basis. It's all intertwined. One of the major impacts directly connected to this tendency to circle the wagons is that outreach and evangelism in the Christian church has become a scheduled event rather than a pattern of life. The church where I grew up was Tuesday night visitation. We had church Sunday morning, church Sunday night, Wednesday night Bible study, prayer meeting, choir practice, and Tuesday night was visitation. And once a month, Super Saturday Soul Winning Surveys. <laughs> yes, say that three times fast. I had the survey memorized. I had been so often. I could go down, I didn't even have to look at the page, and you know, I was just staring at them, asking the questions, not even looking at what I was writing. Because the whole goal was to ask the questions to lead to the gospel. Not that these things are wholesale bad or wrong. There was effectiveness in reaching people with the gospel through these different things, these different methods of outreach. But here's the thing. The pattern we see in the Bible is not a scheduled event. Evangelism, sharing the gospel, is not a scheduled event in the scripture. Let's think back on that phrase. In the world, but not of the world. It's based on a John 17. Jesus' high priestly prayer on the night when he was going to be betrayed. He's in the garden pleading and praying to God. And you notice his prayers are largely not for himself, they're for us. That's a whole other sermon there. But that he's praying for us. He's praying for believers, both around him, the apostles. He's praying for their strength and those who would trust in him because of their witness and their words. That means you and me. He's praying for you in John 17. Here's what he says, verses 14 through 19. This is where we get that idea, in the world, not of the world. He says, praying to the Father, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask you, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They're not from the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the, in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in, in truth. We live as though in the world, not of the world. That's the order it takes place. We're in this world but we're not supposed to be of this world. And all of our energy and effort is put into we're trying our best not to be of this world. But the language of the text says not of this world is not the end, it's not the goal, it's the starting point. You see, the language of, of John 17 points the pattern of in the world, not of the world, as that pattern which follows Jesus. Jesus was not of this world, but yet was sent and came into this world. Jesus came into the world on a mission. This is the heart of the gospel. Jesus is declaring in his prayer to the Father, he's saying, I am not of this world, but I have come into this world for a purpose. Jesus came because you and I had a problem. Jesus came because you and I had messed up. The storyline of the scripture shows that God created all things and he made it good. He's the heavenly king and Lord over all things. We live in his house. Under his rules. But yet, beginning with our very first parents, Adam and Eve, every single person, both by choice and by nature, have rebelled against their maker. And sinned against God. None of us can live the life that God demands. None of us can make God happy with how we live. Because everything that we do is so twisted and tainted by sin that we cannot possibly make up. For our wrongs. Isaiah even writes that even our best deeds are as filthy rags compared to God. And this is where we find ourselves. 
But God in His love did not leave us under His judgment for our sins. God in His love did not leave us there. Rather, He sent Jesus into the world. Jesus was not of the world, but He was sent into the world. Think about all the songs we sang at Christmas just a month ago, a couple weeks ago. Jesus was sent into the world to rescue, to save. Jesus came and lived a life that you, could, you and I couldn't live. Yet God in His mercy put your sins and mine on Jesus on the cross. And when He died, He declared, it is finished. What's the it? That's the million dollar question. The it is the payment for your sin. When Jesus died and breathed His last, He paid debt you owe to God for your sin. And when He rose again three days later, it affirms and declares that you, by trusting Him alone, can be made right with your Maker. All your sins forgiven. And your eternity secure with Him. Jesus was not of the world, but He was sent into the world to bring rescue. Those who put their faith in Christ are in that instant made to be not of this world. You see, in the language here of Jesus, the Gospel of John, not of this world is the starting point. And if we follow it through, verse 18, he says, As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. We are not sitting here stuck on this planet. We're not sitting here stuck in this old, wicked, dirty place. God, why don't you just take us quicker? No, we have been sent into the world. As those who by faith in Jesus, by trusting Him, are not of the world. For a purpose. For a reason. For a mission. I like how the writer David Mathis modifies this popular phrase. He says, Christians are not of this world, but sent into this world. Christians are not of this world, but sent into this world. Remember the Great Commission? We get it twice in the, in the, in the New Testament. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We see Jesus there on the mountain speaking to His disciples and saying, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then Matthew chapter 28. The very end of the Gospel of Matthew. The same encounter with the disciples on the mountain right before the ascension. Jesus declares and came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. Of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Acts 1.8 declares, you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Think about it. By faith in Christ, you are made perfect before God. Every wrong and sin you've ever committed, completely covered and made for You've been given the flawless perfection of Jesus. Why are you sin? You ever thought about that? Why are you still here? If you have trusted in Jesus, your sins are forgiven, you are made perfect in the sight of God, why are we still here? For what purpose? To what end? There's nothing we can do in this life to add to our salvation. There's nothing you can do in this life to pay God back for what He has given to you. The only reason God has for leaving Christians here on this planet is because He has left you a mission to do. Notice the language of Matthew 28. He says in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples. The literal language there is, As you are going, make disciples. The command is make disciples. And the context of that command is as you are going. As you are going. Make disciples. That's a new way to think about it. 
the context is as you are going throughout your daily life. In whatever you do, in wherever you are, sharing the good news of the gospel. You see, sharing the gospel is not a scheduled event. It is woven into the fabric of how you live each and every moment of every single day. But yet we often struggle. We have a challenge in talking about Jesus. We don't struggle in talking about football. Who the next Dolphins head coach is going to be. I don't think that's been announced yet. We don't struggle about talking about how this new diet plan or exercise plan is affecting our bodies and our lives. We don't struggle in talking about our, our occupation or, or things going on with our house or family dynamics. We don't struggle in talking about all those different things. But for some reason, for many of us, when it comes to talking about Jesus, we find it as intimidating and terrifying as trying to do a root canal on an alive and happy, angry lion. <laughs> But we need to get in the habit of talking about Jesus and our church and the Bible. We talk about the things we love, right? What is it you're most likely to talk about with the people you're surrounded by? You talk about the things you love. Your favorite sports team, your favorite hobby, your occupation, what you know about, what you've been reading recently. It, politics. We talk about the things we're enthralled with, the things that we love, the things we're passionate about. Why are we not talking about Jesus? And this is not as a heavy-handed attack on the other person, but rather we talk about the things that we love to the people we love. We need to get in the habit of putting Jesus on the table in our conversation. Talking about the fact that this past weekend, I was at church. We talked about God. We sang songs and praise to Jesus. You know, Legos are a big deal in our house. Most of you know we have four sons, so Legos kind of comes with a package. Careful where you step. It includes the Lego movie. Yes, everything's awesome. There's a scene in the Lego movie that just, as I think back on it, just kind of blows my mind. There's a scene when Emmett, the, the main character, has been caught by the evil Lord Business who's trying to essentially super glue everything together in the Lego world that's you know, catastrophe. Emmett is caught there, and they go and they show a video clip of how they interviewed all the people he knows. His co-workers, his neighbors, the people on the street that he walks past. And, and, and every one of them has something unique. One guy carries sausages, and one guy loves chicken wings, and one guy's got a surfboard, and you know, this guy's got this. And every, everybody's got, got a figure and a character and something that makes them distinct, but Emmett has nothing. He's just plain. He's ordinary. He's got nothing that sets him apart. And when they interview him, they're like, oh, I think I remember that guy. Right? There's nothing really special about him. They look at him and they see there's nothing there. It's just an empty box. What does the pattern of your life say about you? If they're to interview your coworkers and neighbors, the people you engage with on a regular basis, what would they say? They're all about this. They love this. I'm sure most of us would have something that fills that blank. But would they see Jesus? Would they know that you're a Christian? Would they understand your love for God and His gospel? If your neighbors and co-workers were brought in here and, and asked, what do you know about so and so? What would they say about you? Christian, the pattern of your life should both display in action and declare in words the good news of Jesus Christ. Friend, if you're here this morning, and perhaps for the first time you've understood why Jesus came, the call to you is to turn from trust in yourself and put your trust, put your confidence in what Jesus came to do. Jesus came into this world to rescue you, to save you, 
And he accomplished it by dying on the cross and rising again. Turn from trusting yourself and trust in what God has done through his son to make you right. Find the forgiveness and the love and the right standing that your soul has been longing for. When we talk about gospel rhythms, I want us to take a little bit of time and just think about three strategic and intentional spheres of life. Three strategic and intentional spheres of life that we need to think in when we talk about living in gospel rhythms. Living with a strategic intentionality for the sake of the gospel. Underlying each of these three rhythms is the need in our culture for what has been come, become to be called pre-evangelism. You know, it's unusual for a person in our culture to meet a stranger, hear the gospel, and turn and believe it in one conversation. That's very unusual. It happens, but it's very unusual. The gospel most often and most easily slides on the rails of relationship. And here's, here's the kicker. Our society and culture, the people in our society are screaming for real relationships. They're screaming for real, true, authentic relationships. We inhabit the most connected generation that has ever existed on the planet. Many of you with a smartphone in your pocket can reach out to hundreds of people in an instant through social media or a text message. Yet the number of real, true friends the average person has is dwindling. As a Christian, you need to be a friend. Not just a Facebook friend. Not just a Twitter follower. And a friend, not just to Christians. But a friend to the non-Christians who are around you. When was the last time you made a friend? We talk about that with our, with our children, right? You need to go make friends. You need to go meet those people at the park. Go, go make friends. When was the last time we in, in, embraced our own advice? When was the last time you made a friend? Underlying each of these spheres that we're going to talk about is the need to be a friend. The need to see people as real people, not just projects to work on. They have real lives and real thoughts and real emotions. And some people may object saying, well, you're, you're just making friends because you want to push your religion. Think about it from this perspective. If I had a million dollars to give you, and I wanted to get to know you a little bit before I started talking about the million dollars. How many people would object? Nobody. What we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ is far greater than a million dollars. It's eternal life. It's forgiveness and a right standing before your maker. What we have to share is worth make it a friend. So the first sphere, it's where you live, it's your home. Do you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? It's Luke chapter 10, if you wanted to look it up later today. The parable of the Good Samaritan, the whole story is predicated on this question, who is your neighbor? Everyone knows you should love your neighbor as yourself. That, that's that, that's the, the common knowledge, the embrace. Everybody in the culture says, yeah, I'm going to love my neighbor. But then one of the smart guys, put the scare quotes on it, Comes to Jesus and says, but who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells this parable about the Good Samaritan. And most of us who are a little bit familiar with the Bible understand it. The, the Good Samaritan story says, even those you don't like, even those you're not really connected with, whoever happens to be sitting in front of you at that given moment, that's the one you, could, you should consider your neighbor. And you ought to love them. And we, this has been preached and this has been taught. This has been hammered away that we need to be neighborly. We need to love the people even if you don't know them or don't like them. If they're in your path, you need to love them. Yes and amen. But if you're supposed to realize that Jesus is also pointing to your literal neighbors. Like literally those people who sit around you in their houses in South Florida, often within a few feet of where you sleep. You need to love your literal neighbors. 
The days of front porch living have passed. And now between air conditioning and automatic garage doors, we are insulated and isolated from the people who live merely feet away from us. And sadly, it takes a hurricane to knock the power out for people to actually get outside and meet their neighbors. Here's a clarifying exercise. And you can do this even right now if you want. You flip over the bulletin, you find a space to take notes. Some of you filled that up. Some of you didn't even know that was there. Just find a scrap piece of paper perhaps later when you're at home and draw a tic-tac-toe board. You know, two lines like this, two lines like this. In the center box, draw a little house, and that's you. Your eight closest neighbors. Don't, it doesn't have to be super legalistic with it. If you live on the end of a street and everybody's one way. Just your eight closest neighbors. Can you name the adults in your eight closest neighbors' homes? Can you listen? Do you know them? Have you met them? Have you talked with them? That's a clarifying exercise. I dare say for most of us in this room, we probably could not fill up all eight boxes. Most of us would feel good if we could fill up half. It's a clarifying exercise because it, it helps us see and realize how connected or lack thereof we are with our literal neighbors. It can be a convicting exercise. It was for me when I did. Use this paper as a prayer list and as a reminder to love your neighbors. So how do you love your neighbors? You know, it might start by going over and knocking on a door and saying, Hi, I'm your neighbor. Good to meet you. That gets a little awkward, especially if you've lived there for a while. I've lived across the street from you for the last 10 years and never actually got to know your name. Waved at you at the mailbox a few times, but that's been about it. It, it. it may be awkward, but that's okay. It needs to start by at least going over and introducing yourself. Invite your neighbors over for coffee or dessert. Watch a football game together. Perhaps walk your dog at the same time that your neighbor does so you can have a conversation. Ask for help with a project. Hey, I'm moving a couch in. Could you give me a hand? Offer to help with a project. Make some cookies and take them over as a gift. When you see that their garbage can hasn't been wheeled back up or their grass perhaps hasn't been mowed in a couple weeks, rather than calling the HOA and complaining, how about go knock on their door and say, Hey, I noticed your can was sitting out. You, you guys okay? You've been sick? Can I help you? Can I wheel it back for you? We need to reclaim the front porch living by sitting and playing at the front of our houses for the purpose of engaging our neighbors, for the purpose of meeting people. We try to play in our front yard as often as we can, especially around the time of about 4.30 till about 6.30 when all of our neighbors are coming into our street so we can wave hi and have a conversation and meet them and get to know them. You need to be a friend. And in that friendship, talk about Jesus. The second sphere. It's where you work. It's your job. It's your school. This is the place where you spend the majority of your time outside of your home. This is the place where you will consistently see the same people over and over again. <coughs> being intentional at work begins by being the best worker you can be. <coughs> there is a direct connection between how well you work, your worth ethic, your work ethic, and how much your words at work will carry weight. Do, do not confuse the two. If you slack off and cut corners at work, your words at work will be slack and have corners coming. Your voice in your workplace will only be as strong as your work ethic. We need a faithful witness in our work. So that when our words come, they come with the same integrity and the same honesty that our work carries. We cannot be people who cheat and cut corners. We need to work with deep honesty and integrity in all that we do. And amid the day in and day out of working, the nature of our conversation ought to again put Jesus on the table. And I know different jobs 
And different workplaces have different regulations on what is and what is, isn't allowed. So they're like, you can't talk about politics, you can't talk about religion, anything else is fair game. But here's the thing, there are ways to speak about who you are and what you believe, even amid those regulations, so that the person, when they punch out on the clock, is able to continue a conversation. And if you develop real friendships, those friendships last beyond the working hours. Again, be a friend and talk about Jesus in the midst of work. This third sphere is where you play. Community gatherings. This category is broad and encompasses everything from going to the park, going to the coffee shop, going to the grocery store, to the mall, to community events. All the occasions where you can put yourself around other people in the community. Here's where rhythm really kicks in. You know, Joseph and I meet almost every Tuesday at 10 a.m. at Dunkin' Donuts around the corner. It's not just because I like coffee, although I do. But it has to do with the strategic intentionality because we have met every worker there. We've had the opportunity to invite everybody behind the counter to church. We've had the opportunity to speak about the gospel to several of them, counseling one of the managers who's... Uh, whose parent passed away recently, and able to see many of the same customers because they're there at the same time every single week. Part of that is intentionality, is rhythms. Because sharing the gospel matters. It matters that we build relationships that are there to share the gospel. We also go to the Dom Pan. I know I said that wrong again, guys. Dom Pan. Is that, is that right? I need coaching on that every time I mess it up. This is where we did our men's study last fall. There too, many have been invited to church. The gospel has been shared with several. It's rhythm and intentionality. Maybe it's your weekly grocery store routine. You go to the same grocery store about the same time a week and you get in the same cashier's line. Even though it may be longer than the other. Why? So you can develop a friendship. Give a smile. Brighten their day and look for opportunities to speak the truth of the gospel. Maybe it's the gym where you can go and work out at the same time, day after day after day, and get to know the other people that are there at the same time on the same routine. Maybe it's a club or a league in which you can play or your children can play. Whatever it is or wherever it is, live with strategic intentionality. Speak with kindness. Offer compassion. Be a friend. And look for opportunities to talk about Jesus. You know, my reading and preparing for today, I came across an article from Tim Brister. And he said this, The beautiful thing about re-entering every place is that they are already where you live. The goal is not adding a busy agenda to your life. Rather, the goal is to simply simplify and streamline your life with strategic intentionality. What I'm encouraging you to here today is to embrace the pattern we see in the book of Acts. To embrace the commission we receive from the Lord Jesus Christ. That as we are living this life, as we are going throughout this life, we have a custom and a pattern and a rhythm to how we live so as to be most strategic and intentional in the sharing of the gospel. I don't want to put something else on your calendar. But I want your calendar to be thickly interwoven with the words of the gospel. So that your life, wherever it may be, Is proclaiming the truth of the gospel. We don't have time, but there are other things that need to wrap around these three spheres. Prayer being one of them. We need to wrap all three spheres with prayer. Praying intentionally that God would open opportunities to speak and then looking for Him to do so. And when they come up, not being surprised. You know, it's, it's almost comical how often we pray for things. And then when God does it, we're like, oh wow! When we pray, we ought to look expectantly for God to answer. And when He does, be ready to engage and to speak with enthusiasm and joy. Like any good habit you want to form. 
It takes effort and planning before the rhythm and pattern begins to come normally. Develop gospel rhythms. Because sharing the gospel is not an event. It's a pattern of life. Jesus came into this world for a purpose, to save sinners. And if today is the first day you have heard and understood that, turn from trusting yourself. Repent <coughs> of your sins against God. It literally means turn around. And trust that what Jesus did was enough for you. And in that instant of trusting, your sins are wiped away. And your eternity is secure with Him. Because Jesus was sent into this world, He also has sent us into this world. If you are a Christian here today, He is giving you His message, not as another thing to add to your busy calendar, but as a pattern of your life impacting all the spheres in which you live. Be a friend. And talk about Jesus. Trust God to advance His kingdom. Through your faithful words and your faithful witness. Father, thank you for the power of the word. Thank you that we have a message to be about. You have not left us here aimlessly. You have not left us here wandering what we ought to be doing. You have given us clear instruction. Lord, help us to be intentional and strategic with it. Lord, I pray that your spirit would apply your word to every heart here exactly as we need to hear it. And Lord, may we respond to you as you are calling us. Father, thank you for the great joy of being on this side of the cross, of seeing the story in its fullness with the privilege to believe. And Lord, may we be daily sharing and calling others to believe as well. Fill us with rhythms in our lives that grease the skids for the wonderful words of the gospel to move forward. For you have promised that you have a people in this city and that by your grace you will bring them to yourself. Thank you for this privilege. Help us now as we respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen.